Hey everybody, welcome to our final installment of our series on the book of Galatians. This has been an exciting journey. David and I have enjoyed it very much. We'd mm -hmm. like to know if you've enjoyed it. Let us know in the comments if, if you have benefited spiritually from this journey, if the book of Galatians has opened to your understanding. And more specifically, this was kind of an experiment. David and I doing this together as a conversation and inviting you to the table. And we'd like to know if you enjoy this format. Is it edifying? Is it beneficial? Let us know in the comments. Amen. And we're ready to dive in to the last part, part eight, right? Part eight, eight Galatians and we're in chapter, chapter six. six. It's Grasping a little, Galatians. Yeah, it's a little bit weird, part eight, but we're in chapter six because we didn't divide it chapter by chapter. Yeah, because so. it was just too, too much information to just do in six parts. I mean, we've rushed. I feel like we've rushed, we've rushed to some degree yeah. in eight parts. Yeah, we began with 22 <coughs> titles. We were going to take a long time <laughs> to get through the book of Galatians, and we narrowed it down to eight, and uh, it's been enjoyable, though. I've learned a lot. It's been, this is bittersweet. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, we're at the end here. Yeah. We're yeah. at the end, but it's, it's a great end. It is. And, the, um, chapter six of Galatians is nothing short of remarkable. It's incredible, and I think we've got a good title, but before we get to the title, mm. why don't you pray? Father in heaven, we want to invite your spirit to be here with us, to work within our minds and our hearts. We want to see things, mm. God, Amen. the way they really are from your perspective. And we want to understand what Paul is saying as he's addressing uh, the situation that is taking place in Galatia. There's been an upset and uh, he's addressing some very sensitive issues, God. And we know that human nature is very much the same down through history, and there are vital things for us to learn here about how we do life, how we do church, how we interact with others, and most importantly, how we perceive Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and relate to him as our eternal Savior. So please, God, help us understand in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, David. So, Galatians chapter 6. six. Galatians yes. chapter 6. Let's dive right in. Do you want to begin? Yeah. Yeah. I, I just want to remind us of that last verse of chapter 5. We, we finished when we, when we came out of chapter 5. We were talking about the works of the flesh, which Paul says are obvious, and then the fruit of the Spirit. Mm. And that was a great, I felt yeah. really good about our conversation. Yeah. That, was, that was wonderful. And then remember this, just sort of tacked on at the end there, verse 26. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Because he just said earlier in chapter 5, you got to be careful because if you carry on down this pathway, if you keep on this trajectory, he says you'll end up biting and devouring each other. Mm. Watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. And, and what we see in both chapter 5 and chapter 6 is, is Paul is drawing what we might call the theological content of his argument, the, the sort of main thrust of his argument. And now he's making a series of pastoral urges right. and, and uh, pleadings and yeah. uh, it's, it's good. Kind, it's, of, kind of if this, if this theological paradigm is true and he believes that it is and what we does believe life that look it is, like? what does life look like if you live out of Messiah's faithfulness? What Beautiful. does it look like? How to, do we behave? Yeah, how do we behave? And so we've titled this final installment in the series uh, number eight, Beautiful Scars, for reasons that will become evident as, as we move through the chapter. But as David has said, when we come into chapter six, Paul is now giving practical application. You could say that Paul is an ancient practitioner in chapter six of what has been popularly called empathy. Mm. He's asking us in chapter six to tune in to what's going on with others and be there for them. Come alongside right? them. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so you want me to read here? How about if I go, say the first two verses? Sure. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. You see what I meant by saying that he's an ancient practitioner of empathy. Empathy, yes. Right. And, and I really love the, uh, there's, a, there's a bit of a, a shift here, mm -hmm. right? That, that's a bit of an unexpected first verse coming out of the last verse of chapter 5, let us not become conceited, provoking, mm. envying, and then here he says, gentle, yeah. right? To, to, to come alongside, to restore, to minister to someone gently. I mean, Paul has been in this book, I mean, his passion, 
his frustration, even at times his anger have been on display, mm. and yet Paul is always in full possession of his emotions. He knows who Jesus is, he knows who he is. He's not just flying off the handle like a crazy person. Mm -hmm. This is, as we saw in that in beautiful section there in sort of the middle of Galatians 4 where he says, I, I was with you, you received me like an angel, I mm. love you. He doesn't say exactly those words, I love you, but it's all there. And so you get a sense that Paul was passionate, he was articulate, he was energetic, he was the energizer bunny, but he also loved people. Mm -hmm. He knew how to relate to people, he knew how to empathize with people, he knew how to draw alongside people, and here he encourages the churches in Galatia to do that. In chapter 5, as well as in chapter 4, he's articulated a really high moral standard and he's drawn a yes. contrast between the works of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit, right? Correct. So he has he has, you know, named certain things and he said, you know, if you do, well, if you practice these kinds of things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. So this is very pointed and then having exalted this moral standard, right? And mm. said this is these are the kinds of things you don't do right. if you are someone who belongs to the Messiah, right? After exalting this high standard, he says, but if anyone is overtaken in a fault, Correct. restore. So the default mode within Messiah's community, within the Christian community, is restoration, not condemnation. We're not writing people off. We are noticing that, in fact, we are humans. Life we is hard. Fail. Life is hard. People make mistakes. Yeah. And we should be tuned in to one another with compassion, with empathy. He very specifically says, if somebody is overtaken in a trespass, if somebody fails, if somebody falls, if somebody does something wrong within the body of Christ, what is the go-to response? Well, restore that person. Move through a restoration process. Don't just indiscriminately write people off for their failures. And yeah. we've seen this over and over again. Um, through the years, David, I have, I have noticed a very distinct and different response to compassion, understanding, conversation, providing a restoration path versus the cold shoulder, the shunning, marginalizing, yeah, the shunning, ignoring. pushing people out. People who have real problems and fall Oftentimes, if the community surrounds them, loves them through it, they will pick up the broken pieces, reassemble their lives, and move forward Beautiful. in Christ. Beautiful. In the, the characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit that we talked about the last time we were together, we noted that there were nine of them, mm. and this breaks up nicely into those three triads. The first three I suggested are, are largely God word mm. directed toward God. Those second three are how we relate to each other. And, and just listen to these words in light of everything you just said there, and it was so beautifully said. Forbearance, which is like extreme patience, yeah, right? Yeah. Forbearance, kindness, and goodness. Yeah. So, so mm. draw alongside people. Don't write them off, as you say. Draw alongside them with forbearance and kindness and goodness. One of my very favorite books is a book called The Desire of Ages. I know it's one of your favorite books mm. as well. And in that book, the author Ellen White says this, the very essence of the gospel is restoration. Mm, mm, mm. I mean, the, es the very essence, I've never forgotten that. The first time I read it, I underlined it, and I thought, I will never forget this. Yeah. So when Paul says here, if someone's overtaken in a fall, and I like even that language, because there is a difference between rebelliously, serially, habitually sinning, living in these works of the flesh, mm. and making a mistake, tripping up, saying the wrong thing, thinking the wrong thing, doing the wrong thing. In a moment of weakness, you're tempted, you're overtaken in a fall. Yeah, well, you're yeah. already, when that happens, mm. you're already beating yourself up. Right. Shame has uh, uh, you know, emerged, guilt has emerged, fear, you know, all of these sort of emotions. Come, and the last thing that you need is for your community, your people, your tribe, to point the long finger at you and say, what were you thinking? Why did you make that decision? What a poor choice. Right. Paul says, no, if someone's overtaken in a fault, restore. come alongside yeah. them gently yeah. and restore them. Somebody said to me recently, um, just kind of pulled me aside, someone in our community, and it was so moving because 
Um, she, she gave a little bit of insight into her situation. She told parts of her story that, that I knew, but she was revisiting them. And she said these simple words. She said, thank you for not giving up on me. Because there were points along the way when she was overtaken in failures and faults and she was sinking and, and rather than Rather than writing Beautiful. her off, we surrounded her, and now she, she's saying, thank you for not giving up on me, because the very fact that you kept loving me, the very fact that you forgave, the very fact that you were patient with me, the very fact that you didn't bring up what I had done over and over again. Actually, we didn't bring it up at all. We just said, you're our sister. Come on. We know and what's we just happened, kept, and we, we don't just love you any forward. less. We don't love you any less. And she, she just feels like, I wouldn't be here. I would not be here if you had not been patient with me. And now I am, and then she went on to give a part of her testimony, sober for a period of time, off drugs, off alcohol, and just feeling really good about life, about Jesus, about the church. And all she had ever known mm. was a, just a cycle of, of you know, rising and falling, rising and falling, rising and falling. And uh, there she is, just thankful for what Paul is describing in this text. I, I love the fact that Paul has already said in Galatians 5 that the people that have put their faith in Messiah, the people that are at the table of Messiah by his faithfulness, are led by the Spirit. Mm. Led by the Spirit. Now, now look at, at verse 1 again and just note this great little insight here. It says, you who live by the Spirit. And yeah. now, in my translation, it's capital S. Yeah. And by the Holy Spirit. If, if the people that live by the Holy Spirit are drawing alongside in empathy, in compassion, in restorative assistance, that must mean that that's the posture of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. That's God's posture. It's, it's no wonder he's called the comforter. Mm -hmm. Right? You sit in a comfortable chair. You sit... God is, should be comfortable to us. Now, now obviously, there are, there are a sense in which he's holy. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. He's infinitely above us. And if we came into his immediate presence, we would be terrified of his majesty. But his demeanor toward us, his attitude toward us, his posture toward us is gentle. Mm, yeah. And yeah. we should echo and show that same kind of example in the way that we relate to others. And the church, the Christian community, should be a place people automatically when they're failing, they're falling, things are going wrong in their lives, the marriage is falling apart, children are right. rebelling, people are falling into addictions, whatever it may be, what if the church were to conduct itself in such a way, and we've known local churches that have done this, true. David, it's true. That, that, that the first thing a person thinks of when they're sinking in life is, I need to go find myself a community of Jesus followers because they're going to help me get through this rather than fearing that if I go to church I need to have my act together first no you don't need to have your act together first it is precisely because we don't have our act together mm. that Messiah has provided a community a climate an atmosphere of healing and restoration the church should not be a place of condemnation it is a judgment free zone hmm. for people who are struggling to find their way out of the muck and mire of life and we have to hold that obviously in tension with paul who has put on display here his deep passion his deep concern even his anger and his energy toward those that are bringing in disunity. Mm. When Paul speaks here of those that are overtaken in a fault, this is not serial uh, disunity. This is not serial, uh, uh, fa uh, not just These failures. These are false teachers. Yeah, yeah. People that are coming in to, to purposefully provoke, to agitate. Yeah. And so Paul is not saying be gentle with every single person. There were times where you have to not be gentle. And he, and he was not gentle right. with those who came from Jerusalem. He said pretty strong things, right? He said, you yeah. know, he said very strong things about what they were doing because they were threatening Correct. the community of Christ. They well were said. threatening the body of Christ, which is to be a place of healing and restoration. And Beautiful. they were they were subtracting from that atmosphere. And so they were people that Paul dealt with very straightly. And he, and he says here, what do you think of this, this line? You read it, but I'm just going to call our attention to it. He says, bear one another's burdens. 
bear one another's burdens. I love he, it. He's not talking here about, about the physical weight of a bag full of something, of material weight, a bag of potatoes or carrots. It's, it's a burden, but bearing the burden is a physical metaphor for the fact that people have emotional weight. Correct. People have moral weight. People have issues going on in their relationships that are heavy. Sometimes you can sense the heaviness in a person's life and experience. And Paul is saying here that we need to, we need to come alongside and bear the weight for them. And I know all kinds of ways can be suggested, but there's a practical way that I've discovered over the years that we can bear one another's burdens. And it seems so simple, and yet it's profound. And that is to let people know that what you see does not in any way turn you away from them. People already know their mm. failures and mistakes. But if they know that, hey, they know me, they know my situation, they know my failures, but they still love me. Correct. So you've come alongside and you're bearing the burden by letting them know, hey, I see, I know, life is hard, and I am not fundamentally better than you. You know, yeah, you, you have right. your issues, I have my issues, right? Yeah, everybody I know, totally. David, I don't know if you've noticed this, everybody I know, and this is really, really uh, not the best language, but it'll make the point, everybody I know is both a conservative and a liberal. Hmm. It just depends on the subject. Uh, okay. There are things that I'm not tempted by. Mm. I'm not going to struggle with X, Y, or Z, but I may struggle with A, B, and C. So we need to really just dig into the idea that not only do we bear one another's burdens, but he says that we should consider ourselves lest we also be tempted. We're as liable to err, I'm as liable to err, Correct. you're as liable to err as the person who we just witnessed engage in some kind of failure, yeah, right? Make a mistake. And I love the fact that he calls this bearing one another's burdens the law of Christ, right? Mm. So he says, so fulfill the law of Christ. For me, when I hear that, I immediately go to, I, th I think of, of Isaiah 53, right? Paul has just quoted Isaiah 54 in the, what, two, in, back in chapter four, but Isaiah 53, of course, is the well-known suffering servant chapter. And if you go through and you read Isaiah 53 and highlight or underline all of the references to carrying mm. a load or bearing a burden or having a weight, it's, I, I almost wonder if he has that in mind here because the law of Christ is literally to bear, to carry a weight. I mean, think about the great invitation that Jesus extends there in the Gospel of Matthew, what's arguably like the centerpiece of the entire Gospel of Matthew. Mm. Come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, mm -hmm. and I will give you rest. Take my yoke. A yoke is a device that enables you and I to share a load. Mm -hmm. This is the law of Christ, and, and not just in the sense of not judging or not holding in contempt, but there are other ways to bear people's loads. Paul is going to talk about money here in just a little bit and being a generous person, and, and you will reap what you sow. We can bear people's loads by being financially generous. Mm. We can bear people's loads by they have a need. Somebody has to move house. Maybe somebody's kicked out of their house. Well, you have an extra room. There are lots of mm. practical ways that we can bear the burdens of those around us. Sometimes it's just a listening ear or a smile or an affirmation. But th the notion that we're going to come alongside people, and if they're heavy laden and burdened down with life, because life is hard, man. Yeah. We put the yoke of Christ across them and we walk as a community buoying them up. This is one of the great features of the apostolic community. You read about it in the mm. opening chapters of Acts that they would just pool their resources together and whoever had need, they were going to be okay. Mm -hmm. uh, we live in a day and age today where there's social safety nets and other things, but that early church, the social safety net was, was the, the church, church. That's right. right? Mm. Whether it was a widow or an orphan or somebody that, in fact, this was what the early church was known for, for ministering to the poor. Remember mm, that when mm. Peter extended the hand of fellowship to Barnabas and Paul, what did they say? Remember the poor. Mm -hmm. Bear their burdens. Life is hard, and it's especially hard for those that don't have some of the niceties and the amenities that those of us that do have them are accustomed to. Yeah. So there's lots of ways to fulfill the law of Christ and to come alongside people. Somebody said to me years ago, it's so simple, but the, the person said, you know, 
question answer, what is money for? Money is for helping people. Beautiful. That's what money's for. Yeah, money's a tool. It's a tool. Correct. It's not, it's, 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 it's for helping people. Okay, how about verses? We're uh, in, we're in for, uh, I just want to say one more word about verse 3, which you just mentioned. If anyone thinks, oh no, I guess we you haven't didn't read no, verse no, 3 No, 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 I haven't read verse 3 yet. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Mm. Now, now, just make a note of this. This has got that chapter 2, verse 6 vibe to it. Maybe I'll just uh, quote this here. All the way back in Galatians chapter 2, verse 6, listen to this. But from those, this is Paul's describing when he went up with Barnabas and Titus to Jerusalem, right? To, because there was this sort of controversy that was breaking out over the nature of Torah and all that. We've been over it, but just listen to this. But from those who seem to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows no personal favoritism for they who seem to be something added nothing to me. Paul here uses this same language, right? If anyone thinks that there's something, they deceive mm. themselves. Paul here almost certainly has in mind people who had sort of puffed themselves up, mm. postured themselves up as being the spiritual ones, the yeah. ones who know what's really there's going on. something. They're going to educate, mm. you know, these foolish and blind children and babes. They're going to bring... And Paul's saying, actually, they're leading you astray. Yeah. And if someone postures themselves and presents themselves as being over and above. And we've all met people like this. Mm -hmm. Paul says if they think themselves to be something when they're not, yeah. they're not fooling anybody except themselves. Yeah, self-importance, conceit, arrogance. arrogance is actually diminishing. It's, it's revealing weakness, not strength. And it's universally unattractive. Mm. I mean, who regards self-important, arrogant people? I mean, now that I'm even saying that, I'm actually checking myself because a significant percentage of the people that are lauded by the world and are lauded in the prevailing culture do come off as kind of mm. self-important and arrogant, and it's super unappealing and unattractive. Sure is, and, yeah. And Paul says here, if somebody behaves that way in the context of the Christian church, the, the community, he says they're just deceiving themselves. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. has got that sort of vibe where Jesus said, you know, two men went up to the temple to pray. One couldn't even lift his eyes to heaven and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And the other, you know, says what? Oh, I'm glad I'm not like this guy. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm so thankful I'm not like him. That's mm -hmm. self-importance. That's yeah. arrogance. And the fact is you are like him. <laughs> and, and the point that Jesus makes is one of these people is self-deceived. Yeah. One of these people knows exactly what he is, exactly what she is, and the other one is self-deceived. Mm, mm. Okay. okay, verse 4, you ready? Yep. Each one should test their own actions, then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. My version says, boast. have rejoicing in themselves. Oh, I like that. Yeah. I like that. There, there's a legitimate, I mean, conceit and arrogance and self-importance is very unattractive and, and, and wrong, but there is something to be said for a sense of confidence in Christ. Yeah, and not just confidence, but also competence, right? Mm. Like people that, that know the word and people that are good, humble people or mm -hmm. have excellence in some yeah. area Paul's of life. Paul's displayed that. He, he certainly he's, has. He said in so many words, hey, you want to talk scripture? I know scripture, so you're going to deal with somebody who actually is right. proficient in the word. That's not conceit. That's not arrogance. He simply is self-aware. He knows, hey, I've, I've done my work. I know scripture and I'm going to teach it to you yeah. effectively. Competence is not unattractive. Competence is highly attractive. Mm. It, it, we are drawn to people that are excellent at what they do. No. But when you see, this is such a, and you sometimes see this in sports, it's, it's so refreshing when you see this in sports or in any area of life, but it often happens in sport, where you see highly competent people that are also quite humble, mm -hmm. right? They, they are not, Law, they're not like presenting themselves as stuff. And when you see the opposite, competency mingled with arrogance, it's off-putting. Right. And yeah. I suppose the worst combination would be incompetence mingled with arrogance. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and then this kind of, there's a little this tension is, here yeah, with verse, verse 5, five yeah. because he says, for each one should carry their own load, which seems to stand in significant tension. It does stand in significant tension with verse 2. Carry one another's burdens. Yeah, carry one another's burdens, he just said. And but then he says, but each load. one is going to bear his own load. What do you think is going on there, Tom? I think what's going on there is, in the first instance, verse 2, he's describing the proper dynamic within the body of Christ. Yes. Empathy, gentleness, restoration. And Love I think it. in verse 5, he's talking about 
out of that community, ultimately each one is going to stand before God yes. and in that sense bear his own load. Yeah, yeah. Every one of us is at, at, in the final analysis, we are all ultimately responsible for our own personality, for our own character, for our own decisions. What does Paul say in his letter to the Corinthians, one of his letters to the Corinthians, chapter 2 Corinthians, I believe it is, uh, we shall each stand before the judgment seat yeah, of Christ, that right? 510, I think, or 105, one of those two. Yeah, exactly. That's mm -hmm. the point. Like, at the end of the day, we can have significant influences, positive or negative, but we are at some level responsible for our own choices, yeah. for our own words, for our own thoughts, for our own actions. And so, Ty, when, when I am finally and fully accountable mm -hmm. to God in my, in my full, unvarnished nakedness, you're not going to be there with me to help me out. But I should have been helping you prior to that. Getting there. That's a good way of saying it, right? Yes. That's the tension there. Exactly. You're going to ultimately stand alone before God, but I should have been helping you along the way, and you should have been helping me along the way to get there Correct. to stand before the judgment seat of yeah, Christ. We use that language of you know, meeting your maker mm. kind of a thing. It's just driving me crazy. It's, it is it's chapter five. It's 510. Yeah, 2 Corinthians 510. All right, so so this is interesting. He, he He's not taking a turn now with verse six. He's simply walking forward with his premise that the Christian community is to be a place in which there is relational flourishing, right? Yes. Because Messiah has been faithful to us. We're called upon to be faithful to one another. And now he's essentially telling us, he's, he's advocating for a covenant ethic of generosity and goodness Correct. toward one another. So verse six, this is interesting. He says, let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. This is interesting, David, mm. because here the Apostle Paul is essentially saying that the vocation of teaching the word of God effectively to others is a legitimate vocation Correct. and there needs to be there needs to be financial provision Correct. so that that task can be done. You don't want to to have a a world and a community in which there are no individuals that have the time and the focus to pour themselves into the text of Scripture and bring the good things from the text of Scripture to the body of Christ for the edification of the body of Christ. So Paul says, verse 6 is essentially saying that those who teach the word should be financially, generously financially supported by those who are hearing the word of God being taught to them. 100%. Paul will often talk about money without saying the word money. Mm. Right? Like, let me just read you a, a He might have similar, been a little shy about it. It's, it's possible. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. But this I say, and he uses the same analogy here, the farming analogy, right? Which would make a lot of sense in a largely agrarian situation and culture. But this I say, he who sows or plants sparingly will also reap sparingly. Uh, he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Mm. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you will always have all sufficiency in all things and you may have an abundance for every good work. That, that is also a text about money. Mm -hmm. It's a text about being generous financially. And in other ways, we can mm -hmm. be generous with our talents, we can be generous with our time, mm -hmm. but we also need to be generous with our money. The Apostle Paul also says, and you can write this one down, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17, he says, support the elders that labor in word and in deed, and some of them that do it really well, this is my paraphrase, he says, they should get double honor. Double honor by which he means they should get more money for the work that they're doing because and, they're very good at what they're doing. And why not? We don't want people that are in ministry for money, but we also don't want to not reward excellence. Hmm. Right? We, we want to... There are people that have a talent, a skill of teaching. They're mm. educators. I, I think that there's not a doubt in my mind, Ty, that one of your gifts and one of my gifts is the ability to teach, the ability to minister, the ability to explain things. And when people show that talent, they should be taken care of by mm. the community, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the thing that I do is, is not particularly marketable out in the world. It's right? just I, not. I'm not going to get a yeah. job at Google teaching scripture. 
That would I'm be not great gonna, though, it would wouldn't be it? Amazing. <laughs> I'm not going to get a job at Amazon teaching scripture. So when you have those people in your community, mm. those men and women that are powerful spiritual teachers and preachers and evangelists, they have to be supported by the community for at least two reasons. Number one, the upbuilding of the community itself, but also number two, the teaching to people who don't yet know or understand mm -hmm. Christianity for evangelists, for people yeah. that can come in to the message. And it, and it, and it is sad, because I've seen it happen, and it would be sad if anybody who is called of God to, to teach and to preach Scripture, and they're doing it well, has to stop doing it just because of financial anxiety, and they have to go out and do something right. else, and forget about what they are called to do because they can't support themselves. Love it. All right, so that's verse six. What about verse seven? Verse seven begins with do not be deceived. And it is interesting that this is already now the second time in chapter six that he said deceived, mm -hmm. right? Because he says, if you think you're something, uh, you better be careful. You better check yourself, as they say, because you might be deceiving right. yourself. Mm -hmm. And then here he says, hey, you don't be deceived. And I like just a brief word before we read the rest of the verse, how Paul does this. He says, if someone's overtaken in a fault, draw close to them and be sure, keep track of yourself. Yeah. What, how does he say that? Watch yourselves or you may also be tempted. Right. Here he says, hey, some people can be self-deceived. And then here he says to the church to whom he's writing, the community, communities, don't be deceived. The standard for all others is mercy. The standard for me toward me is justice. Mm. I, need, I, need to, I need to be generous with others and I need to hold myself to a high standard. I like that. Mm. Uh, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. He's still talking about money here. He is, yeah. I mean, not that there are not larger applications there are larger of course applications. there are but yeah. he's saying if you are stingy with your money you're not going to reap not in the not in the in the larger biblical sense mm -hmm. of raising up souls and teaching people and seeing converts and mm -hmm. people grow in the faith we have to put money into the ministry because people need to live mm -hmm. yeah praise god so so continuing this theme here i want to point out something that i think is absolutely crucial to understand, and, and that is that Paul is describing the way things are. This isn't a false construct. This isn't an overlay. He's not saying, hey, if, if, if you sow to the flesh, God's going to pounce on you. Correct. He's not saying if you sow to the spirit, God is going to you know, pour blessings upon you in some kind of, in some kind of miraculous way necessarily. He's saying, listen, the way you conduct yourself Yes. Is going to have results. Correct. There is a cause and effect relationship between. If you live your life with generosity and goodness, well, then this is what happens. This is what happens if you do that. And if you live your life with stinginess and selfishness, well, this, this is what's going to what happen. In one direction, there's flourishing and thriving. In the other direction, and abundance. is destruction. And, and the fact that he uses an agricultural analogy makes the point, mm. right? Like, Think of it this way, and I don't want to be misunderstood here, so tell me if you track with this, Ty. If you, if you plant a tomato, mm -hmm. right, God doesn't have to come down in that moment and perform the miracle of growing that specific tomato because he's already performed the larger miracle of making the world work in that way. Yeah, exactly. Right? And so, so the agricultural analogy itself is saying when you live like this, this is what results. Mm. You plant tomatoes, you get tomatoes. Let me take the analogy. You plant weeds and and thistles, you yeah. get weeds and thistles. Let me take the analogy a step further. Please. You plant tomatoes, it's unrealistic to expect bananas. Yeah. And that's one of the points that Paul is making. He's saying if you, if you plant a certain, that kind of seed, you're going to get that kind of harvest. If you plant that kind of seed, you're going to get that kind of harvest. I love it. Yeah, you're, you're going to get what you got. Whatever you put in, it's coming back like a boomerang. Everything that God has made in this world operates ultimately by what he calls earlier the law of Christ, the law of love. Now, Ty, can I put you on the spot here? I don't know if you were planning to do this, but I've heard you talk in the past about that's like the law of life. It's just the way 
the universe mm. works. Yeah. Not just in sort of agricultural metaphors here, but just like in the larger, mm -hmm. the larger thing that's happening in the universe. Can, you've already spoken a little bit about yeah. that, but can you unpack that? I've heard you talk about this before, so I'm plugging what you just said into this larger narrative that I've heard you des mm -hmm. describe. Can you unpack that for Yeah, it fits perfectly with the book of Galatians because the book of Galatians is all about the covenant faithfulness we witness on display in Christ, right? Beautiful. The whole world and the universe is designed to operate by the principle of relational integrity or what the Bible calls covenant. And I love what you just said about God performing the larger miracle of creating the world to operate the way it operates. So that if you plant tomato seeds, you get tomatoes. If you plant generosity, you get back generosity. Respect begets respect. People tend to respond to me the way I respond to them, mm, right? And so, the, so. The, whole, the whole world is operating in such a way that, that I think we can say that at every given moment, any given moment, we are witnessing either the reciprocity, the reciprocal love of God in action, or the violation thereof. Mm. So, so, the de so the upside of love is flourishing and thriving because God made the world to operate that way. Love it. And the downside of the same principle is anti-creational destruction. Everything moves upward mm. with love and downward with sin and hate and selfishness. And selfishness. Yeah. Now, when you, you just used a word there that I've heard you use before, anti-creational. Right. So unpack so, that a little bit. So the Genesis narrative. I'm sorry, I'm really putting you on the spot. No, no, here, I don't but mind. I feel like so, we're on the edge of something. Yeah, I so, like this. So the book of Genesis basically begins by God bringing order out of chaos. And that theme is carried through scripture, right? There's order and chaos. Creation, as God, as the author of creation, has made it to operate, brings things to cohesion and order and reciprocation. Everything, anything that is living dies in isolation. You could say it that way. Literally anything that is living. A rock can exist in isolation and it's fine. It's a rock, it's not a living thing. Anything that's alive dies in isolation from the whole, right? Interesting. And so, so everything is moving in the direction of creation or anti-creation, order, disorder, or chaos. Right, and love is... Flourishing or, or death, really. That's right, and love is, according to scripture, according to the, the law of Moses, mm. Torah, according to Jesus, when he, he came along and he, he Gave described, himself. Yeah, Jesus and the whole of scripture demonstrates unequivocally that love is the law of life. It's not something that God artificially rewards. Correct. The reward is present in the thing itself. Beautiful. It happens all around us, and once we see it, we can't unsee it. People respond the way they're treated. People draw close when you draw close. People back up when you back up. Everything I that God it. has made operates by law. And it's very much like the law of gravity. What goes up comes down. Well, what goes in comes out. So whatever the principles are by which I'm operating mm. in my thinking, feeling, and relating process is, it's contagious. It's catchy. People say, wow, you like me? I like you too. That's remarkable how that works. There's a you, reciprocity. There's a reciprocity. It's a circle. It's a circle of life. God's creation is round and rotational, and Satan's system is linear, and it separates and creates isolation. That's, that's the bottom line. That's fascinating. I, when you were speaking there, I was thinking about this idea that, that righteousness is its own reward, right? Righteousness doesn't have to be artificially mm. rewarded by God. Righteousness is its own reward because we were made to operate in a certain way, in a right way. And then the converse of that is also true, or the opposite of that is also true, and that is that sin is its own punishment. Isn't it? Right? Wow. Like, it's not yeah. just that the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is sin. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. you get that momentary flash of titillating pleasure, but it comes with this whole, you know, portfolio of baggage, yeah. of fear and shame and guilt and yeah. disconnection, like you were saying, separation. 
And, and I think it's just so important to understand that, that God is not arbitrary. He's not artificially sort of rewarding this and punishing this and present in every single, you know, instantiation of every act and every, you know, punctiliar event. No. No. God has set the world up to run in a way. That's right. And it mm. runs in a way that righteousness is its own reward and sin is its own punishment. In James, uh, it says sin, when it is finished, brings, brings forth, forth death. death. Yeah, beautiful. So, so this, I just want to read that section again in, in light of everything that we just said, because we got a little mm. philosophical there, which was great. I love that. And we kind of went m majorly macro, right? We went big picture. So let me just read this again and hear it through those ears. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. If a man, a man reap what he sows, man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the fresh flesh will reap destruction. From the flesh. From the flesh mm. will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap what? Eternal life. Mm. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Mm. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Oh, so, so good. One final thing I want to say, back to that tomato plant. God has built flourishing and abundance into the system. If you take a single tomato seed hmm. and you plant one tomato seed, and let's say in, in that tomato plant you get 20 tomatoes, each of which have 20 seeds, you now have 400 seeds. Yeah. Right? So th that's, not, that's not addition by addition. That's mm. addition by mm. exponential. That's multiplication. And then, David... You plant the 400. Then, David, imagine crushing those tomatoes, <laughs> adding some garlic, some cilantro, some red onions, and a little bit of lemon juice, and having some salsa. <laughs> imagine that. Ty, you're a, you're a foodie. You I are, love food. You are I a foodie. Food. Um, okay. Can we go to verse 11? Let's do it. So... Paul now moves, I think, in, into the final, the last breath of the letter. And there's a number of themes that he introduced all the way back in chapter 1 that reemerge here in the very last sort of nine mm, verses, mm. eight verses. And what that tells us is, is that even though Paul is doing this, as you said in one of the earlier sessions, Ty, stream of conscious, stream of con consciousness. Con consciousness, as he's just sort of, and say this and say this and... Paul sees all of this in his mind. He's yeah, not just, yeah. you know, it's not just pell-mell. Yeah. He's firing on all cylinders. He, and he, he, he circles back. Maybe he said to his scribe, read me the first part of the letter again. Okay, re, re, okay. Now say, yeah. write this. He's coming full circle. And, and one of the things that he does here, that's, it's this fascinating little human moment here in verse 11. See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. Yeah. Which is also an indication, as we mentioned earlier, that probably the thorn in his flesh and the issue that he was saying, hey, you guys were really good to me. You treated me well, even though... I had an illness. Yeah. It may well have been and seems, it seems highly likely to me that it had something to do with his eyes. Yeah, you have to write with big. large letters. Yeah. And, and I also just like, Paul does this in several places, by the way. There's several of his letters that he closes by saying, I've signed this with my own hand. Mm -hmm. So the scribe has created the, the, the letter, and then, and then Paul says, okay, where do I write? I sign there. Yeah. Right? I'm, I'm signing off. I'm putting my signature yeah. on it. I, I like that human element there. Yeah, yeah. Now, what would it have been like to have been Paul's scribe? It would have been fun, It man. would have been I mean, amazing. Come on. You get the sense when you read the book of Acts that, that Luke loved Paul, man. He writes about Paul in such wonderful, you know, energetic, really complimentary ways you get the, I mean, if it's true, if, if Christian tradition is true and that, and that Luke was converted in, that, uh, in, that, in Antioch when those men from Cyprus and Cyrene came and he mm -hmm. was one of those early, you know, Greek believers, when he met Paul, he was like, I want to hang out with that guy. Yeah. I'm casting yeah. my lot with that. Where are you going? You're going around the Mediterranean? Oh, not once, not twice, but three. I'm coming. Yeah. He, yeah. Just, he just casts his lot. Yeah. And to be his scribe would have been challenging, too, because I would imagine Paul had to occasionally say, uh, did you write that down? Because you look like you're not <laughs> writing. To which you'd snap out of it. No, I was listening. No, Actually, I was just so I was, busy listening. I was tracking with what you... Let, say it again, and I'll write it this time. Um, verse 12, those who want to impress people by means of the flesh are trying to compel you, we've talked about that theme, haven't we, mm -hmm. to be circumcised. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Now, we just probably should pause on each of these verses and comment a little bit. That's a fascinating little connection there. First of all, the, the first part of that verse is an easy thing, right? Where he's saying, there's mm. people that are trying to impress you. 
the, we talked about arrogance, we talked about self-importance, mm -hmm. we talked about, in not today, but in the past, we've talked about that idea of compulsion. They want to compel, they want right, to force right. you to be, and then this issue raises its head again here, circumcised. And then this is fascinating, Ty, and I want, I want to ask you what's going on here. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. You What's the connection there? Where's the yeah. where's the sequence? Yeah, the only the only way really to understand this is to be aware of what some of the historical dynamics were in that culture. So the wider Greek Roman culture has a, a civic religion. Okay. And there are expectations that are upon everyone, and and uh, those expectations included. Uh, days and weeks and months and years, ceremonial observances Festivals. and showing up at the temple and giving the nod to the gods yeah. and going through those motions. And the Jewish people had an exemption from participating in idolatrous practices because the Roman Empire basically discovered they're incorrigible. We are not <laughs> going to force them. They are rigidly yeah, monotheistic. We, we, they'd, they'd, rather rather die they'd rather die than offer that libation. So, yeah, so we're not going to force them. We're going to give you an exemption. So so let everybody know that this, this little Jewish subculture, these, these weird people, yeah, these weirdos, that, they don't have to participate in the worship of the, the Greek and Roman gods, but... And they did think they were weird. Uh, in particular, circumcision was regarded with absolute well, it, revulsion by well, the Romans. They it, were like, what? Yeah, yeah. You do what? Yeah, well... And, and, they just, and, and one god? And they just thought it was funny. They, they yeah. felt sorry for these crazy people. Well, they thought they had a poverty of gods. <laughs> they were actually accused. The, the, word, the, word, the word atheist, atheist. Has, has its its birthplace in the Greek and Roman people of that part of the world of that time in history saying, you guys are atheists. You don't believe in the gods. You, you, you poor fellas, you yeah. just got one. And they were like, so, one's all we need yeah, because right. he's the only true So they gave God. him a pass, that's they your They gave point. him a pass. They had an exemption from the civic practices. Now you could convert to Judaism by getting circumcised. You could be a Greek guy and get circumcised and you would share then in the exemption. But you had to be circumcised to share in that you exemption. You had to become a Jew. And so here you have the Apostle Paul, he's completely upending the whole system and saying you don't have to be circumcised. If you belong to Jesus, you are Abraham's seed. Israel is now redefined as anybody who's with the Messiah, Christ, and you don't need to be circumcised. So, what's happening here? Obviously, if these people can now claim the traditional exemptions, Monotheistic, right, of monotheism, yep. if they're exempt, well, this is going to make the, the people in that community, in that world at that time, nervous because it's okay to let a few people be exempt from what everybody else is expected to do. But if suddenly everybody can just say, I'm a Jew, I'm a Jew, I'm Abraham's seed, I'm a part of this, and right. well, what's your evidence? Right. You're not circumcised. Well, that puts the heat on the Jews who are circumcised and it makes it look like, well, actually you didn't have a point all along. Right, fair point. It could it could actually threaten the sort of stability. And there would be what did they call here persecution. Yeah, it would this inclusion of other up to this point non-Jewish people in this exemption creates uh, uh, an imbalance and actually threatens the sort of stability of the of the way the system worked. And it was financially driven. So so the entire pagan system, the pagan worship system, I mean, money is being exchanged. Yeah, there are I little was, idols being sold. That's true. The, the that's people true. in that community are making money off of the pagan worship well, system. Well, this is what ends up happening. So the more in, people that pull out... This is what happens in Ephesus in Acts, what is it, 18? Yeah. Right, people, where they're like, hey, this guy is like... People go ballistic. Nobody's buying our idols yeah, anymore. Their okay. livelihood is threatened. That's true. There is an additional element, not just the monetary element, but there's also this strong sense that not only did these gods exist, mm. but they were the ones that were responsible for the flourishing and uh, the, the benefit of a given nation, right. state, uh, area. And if there was floods or there was fire or there was famine or whatever it might be. The, Good gods, props, bad the props. gods are angry. Yeah. And so if you have more and more people not participating in these sort of regional, mm. local, you know, cultic practices, they say, hey, the it gods are going to get angry. System, yeah. and, you, and your disobedience, disobedience threatens our livelihood and yeah. thriving. Yeah, we circumcised Jews. We have a sweet situation here. 
And if you guys aren't sick, circumcised, but you claim to be a part of Israel, a part of, of Abraham's seed, well then, uh, we may lose our good arrangement with the Roman Empire. Gotcha. Okay, so that's, what, that's, his, that's his point there. Mm -hmm. Can I move to verse 13? Let's do it. My, are we on verse 13? Yeah, verse 13. Not even those who are circumcised keep the law, yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your circumcision in the flesh. Mm. Now, this is a point Paul has made again and again, and here he says it in a very pointed way. He said, look, you that want to be under the law, do you hear the law? Yeah. It, it, you, you're, you're now duty-bound to keep the whole of Torah. You mm. can't just pick and choose. Right. And here he's saying, look, Torah's filled. I mean, if, have you read? <laughs> you know, I mean, have you, I, have you yeah. read Genesis, yeah. Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy? There's a lot in there, and Paul is saying they're being a little, a little choosy here, a little picky. They're they're just selecting circumcision. Now, yeah. don't get me wrong. Circumcision was hugely important in Torah, but there's a lot of things they could be concerned about. Right. There's a lot of things they could be majoring in, and his point here is is that look. They're just kind of They're not even up to snuff. They're not up to snuff. They're rabble rousers. They're kind of troublemakers. They're holding you to account for one thing, but there are things that they themselves in the larger yeah. sort of body of Torah are mm. not living up to. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Verse 14. Now this is the, now we're this tied. We're right this down here it. to the end of this. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, because he just said in the verse mm -hmm. before, they boast in the flesh. Yeah. Right? In fact, he says they want to burst, boast about your circumcision yeah. in the flesh, right? Jesus yeah. said that you, you travel, you know, land and sea to win a single proselyte, and then you make him twice the son of hell as yourselves. Yeah. Whoa, did Jesus say that? Yeah, he, he did. did. <laughs> uh, verse 14, may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. This is beautiful, man. Okay. Verse 15 is incredible too, but let's just pause there. First of all, hallelujah, that Paul would say, and he'll, he'll say this later in Philippians 3, whatever things were gained to me, those I count but lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. And he goes on, for whom mm. I have suffered the loss of all mm. things. He is here saying, if I'm going to boast about something, it's going to be in the fact that God's own Son, Messiah, Jesus, came, lived, breathed, taught, Died, died, didn't just die, was crucified. crucified. If I'm going to boast about something, mm. I'm going to boast about the Messiah's faithfulness, not my imagined or pretended faithfulness to Torah, which I really know in my heart of hearts I've not lived up to. You've limited it to, to merely the, the mutilating of your flesh, a single appendage of your body. I'm crucified with Christ in totality. I've died mm. with Christ. I am boasting in the crucifixion of Christ alone that takes in my whole person. My whole person. I am crucified with Christ. What do you think it means when he says, the, by which the world is, let me just read it here, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. I, I like that. Mm -hmm. This has a Galatians 2.20 ring to it. Yeah. It has that I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Paul is so now radically out of step. All believers are so now radically out of step with the way the world operates. Yeah. Right? With these, these powers that have created the present evil age. He says, I'm done with that. I'm living a whole new world in a whole new way with a whole new Lord. Caesar's not Lord. Yeah. Right? Jesus, Jesus is Lord. Is Lord. Mm. And I just love this idea that the, the world, crucifixion was a brutal death, a yeah. brutal, painful, humiliating death. The world is brutally dead to me, and I'm brutally dead to the world. Yeah, I'm completely separated from the way the world operates, and I'm operating by a whole different and new standard. And that whole different and new standard is the Messiah's faithfulness to the point the law of, of Christ. death. Beautiful. To the point of death. Yeah, I said earlier, Acts 18, the, the riot there in Ephesus over the, the uh, selling of the little figurines, I think is Acts 19. I just looked it up real quick. Acts 19. Um, I'm verse. just going to read that verse again. It's okay. so good. May I never boast except in the cross. Incredible. I mean, mm. to, think that you, to think that a Jew would be saying, I mean, this is so counterintuitive. Paul will later say in 1 Corinthians that, that this is foolishness. Right. to the Greeks, and it's a scandal to the Jews. And I, he's, the thing I want yeah. to boast about is that my Messiah figure was nailed to a Roman instrument of torture and cruelty. 
I know it sounds ludicrous, I know it sounds crazy, I know it sounds insane, but the God of the universe, the most powerful person in the universe, loved you and me so deeply, so passionately, that he literally gave his life. Gave himself, mm. gave himself, gave himself. That's the new standard, that is Messiah's faithfulness. Ty, verse 15 is literally the essence of the entire letter. It really is. The, the whole yeah. letter is summarized basically in essence in verse 15. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is the new the creation. The new creation. And, and this is phenomenal because here, here he's come full circle. He began with the Exodus motif and the children of Israel in actually ancient history, a, a, a single people being delivered from a single nation and then he's blown it up and he said, now there's a new exodus underway. And now he goes a step further and he says that this universal application of the principle of exodus gives birth to a whole new creation. The whole world has been remade Hallelujah. in Christ. Or think about it like this. Jesus lived, he died, he rose again from the dead and he ascended to the right hand of the Father and the Christ event puts on display for us what is now representatively true in Christ for the whole world. Wow. And now we're in the process Hallelujah. of living out the implications of the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ. What matters is Everything not, is new. Yeah, what matters is not circumcision or uncircumcision, but the fact that God has completely relaunched the human race in Christ. New creation. New creation. It's, it, Paul hasn't yet written Corinthians, of course, but 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all, all things, things are. are new. Yeah. Everything. Not they're going to be, but they are in Christ new right now. And I, and I love that the, the recapitulation of the, it's neither circumcision nor uncircumcision, because back in chapter 5, he said, uh, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is, and then this is really the essence of it all, mm. faith that works or expresses itself through love. Right. And here he says, yeah, the circumcision thing, that's not it. The uncircumcision thing, that's not it. It's the new, new creation. creation. Yeah, which is equivalent to that faith working by love if you, if you compare the passages. No, they're, they're almost, I mean, really, you can make a case that he's saying the same thing mm. with different language. We've used the illustration before, and I just want to remind us, it's the difference between living with the light of the moon and the light of the sun. Mm. The light of the moon is plenty bright. Torah was bright. Yeah. It was bright. It was great. It, you could navigate your way around, but now that Jesus has come, Torah is set in its proper context. We can't relate to Torah as if Jesus hasn't come. We can't relate to the moon as if the sun's not high in the sky. Mm. The sun is high in the sky. We are in the new day, the new creation, the mm. new dawn, we have to live like that. Praise God. Incredible. Okay, verse 16, peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, to the Israel of God. And that peace and mercy has that sort of grace and peace feel mm -hmm. right at the very beginning, right? Grace mm -hmm. and peace to, uh, to you. And, and he goes on in, in verses, what, three and four. Yeah. And then this fascinating little phrase, the Israel of God. Yeah, Paul believes, Paul believes that the Gentile believers who belong to Christ are, in fact, the a part of, of the Israel of God. Yeah, there are no, there's not two Israels. No, there's one Israel, and these Gentile believers are a part of it. They That's are, remarkable. They're, it's incredible. It's tectonic. Paul will later tease this out in Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11. Mm -hmm. But that, that identification mm -hmm. of Israel... Oh, excuse me, of the Gentiles and as all who trust in the faithfulness of Messiah as part of the Israel of God is a radical, we could say an innovation. Maybe mm. it's an innovation, certainly being articulated this way, it's an mm. innovation. But what it shows us is again, Ty, there's not two tables, there's not two families, there's not two Israels. Mm. There's the Israel of God, there's the single table, the single Messiah. Paul will later say this, and what is it, Ephesians 4? One Lord, one faith, mm. one baptism, mm. Yeah. This fundamental unity, I love it. Really, you can make the case that the entire letter that Paul writes here to the churches in South Turkey of Galatia is driving toward this point. Mm. There is the Israel of God, the singular yeah. definite article. And there is, no, there is no ethnic 
distinction. It doesn't matter if you're an Ethiopian or a Correct. Scot or a whatever you are, you are from Romania, Bulgaria, you are Jamaica, from whatever. Peru, wherever you're from, we are all who belong to Christ. We all of us compose Israel. It's amazing. It's incredible. You're an Israelite, David. Beautiful. Verse 17, from now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. It's like he wrote this letter and he said, okay, I've written this. No more trouble. I don't want, I don't want any more trouble from anybody, for I bear, my version says, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Our title for this final presentation is Beautiful Scars. Mm. Paul had some. Paul had some scars. We've already talked about in Acts 14, he was stoned, stoned in Lystra for being a teacher and preacher of the gospel. I mean, if we could see this guy, he's covered with scars. Yeah, this is a guy who, who in the ancient world, they were not shy about using punishments, <laughs> bodily punishments yeah. and bodily yeah. humiliations. I mean, crucifixion being the extreme example. Paul here, and, and I love because this is tying back to those early themes. Remember, what was, what was the very first thing Paul said in the whole letter? Listen to this, the very first thing. Mm. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by man. Mm. We've already seen that one of the major themes, especially in one and a little bit in two, is the legitimacy, the authenticity, the authority of Paul's apostleship. Mm. And it yeah. has been called into question and Paul here plays, you can tell, this is purposeful, it's rhetorical, it is suggestive. Paul has waited to say this. Mm. He, he's known from the beginning, he's gonna say, you guys know me, some of you nursed me back to health and to life. You saw the scars, you saw the wounds. Mm. And he says, I bear in my body the scar. This is his trump card of apostolic authority, apostolic sincerity, apostolic legitimacy. And, and you, you get this sense, he says, leave me alone. Bother me no more. Yeah. His, Do, show me their scars, show me their wounds. Right. He, he know, he, it's highly likely, even though he never mentions their names, in other places he does sometimes mention names, he, he might very well know who these people are. They could have been some of the people that were initially brought into the church, mm. then have turned, if they're from, if they're agitators primarily from Jerusalem, he might know them mm -hmm. and he would know, they don't have any scars. He, they don't have what he I He identifies, his scars as the scars or the marks of Jesus Christ in his own body. He identifies with Jesus so intimately, David, Incredible. That, that whatever he bears in his body as a follower of Jesus, he identifies with the crucifixion. I don't know who you are. David and I are sitting here studying the Bible. We've invited you to the table and uh, I don't know what you've gone through mm. as a follower of Christ. I know that I've experienced some things. I don't have any physical scars, as Paul had physical scars, but you may have emotional scars. You, you may have scars that you bear in your heart and your mind that you carry as because you're a follower of Jesus. I can be, I yeah. can be very specific here. I know people who've experienced just outright rejection by family members when they have declared their loyalty to Christ. And, that, and that's painful. Deeply painful. But those scars that you bear in your heart, in your mind, because of being a follower of Jesus, those scars are intimately associated with the crucifixion of Christ on your behalf. You know what they are, Ty? They're beautiful scars. They're beautiful scars. I mean, if Paul is happy to say, I'm crucified to the world and the world to me, then he can say the marks that I bear in my body, out teaching, preaching, ministering, those are the marks of Jesus. Mm. I mean, Paul will later write to his understudy Timothy, he will say, all who live godly in Christ Jesus will, will suffer, suffer persecution. persecution. Second Timothy mm. chapter three, verse 12. Ty, I don't have the physical scar. I mean, I got some scars from skateboarding, but yeah. <laughs> Th those aren't the. This that's is not the, the scars. Those that are aren't being the marks of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. But all of us do have wounds. We have failures. Sometimes of our. Sometimes our wounds are our own fault. Very often, mm. and sometimes they're the result of being rejected, as you say, by family members, by friends, by a community, uh, professionally. Mm. These things happen. And if they are in the service of Jesus, Jesus marks every tear. He marks every scar. He marks every every crossword, he marks every betrayal, he marks every broken promise. 
He knows what you've been through. Mm. Paul knows that Jesus knows, mm. and we can take comfort there, in that. Yeah, there's great comfort in knowing that. So, David, that's it. No, we have the last, very last verse. Do we have a, okay, the very what's last, the last verse. verse? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. Amen. Amen. I mean, really, that's how we can end the whole series. That, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. Amen. Amen. Thank you for sharing this time with us through the book of Galatians. Again, we'd like to hear from you uh, in the comments. Have you have you benefited from this study of the book of Galatians? Do you like this format? Should we do it again? Uh, do you want to study some other book, book of the Bible? Yeah, let us um, know. Let us know. We'd love to hear from you. Again. If some of it went by kind of fast, and there's a lot in the book of Galatians, uh, just know that you can go back and watch again and again, take notes, recover the material, and share with us your findings. Mm. Share with us what you've discovered. We are endeavoring to teach the Word of God faithfully, but we are also learners, we are students, and we want to be taught by you as well. So thank you for joining us through the book of Galatians. I think we have to some significant degree, we, we have grasped yeah, I agree. Galatians, I feel David. I feel better about my knowledge of Galatians uh, and of, of Jesus than I did before we started the series. That's true. So let's close off the, the whole series with what it looks like you got something I'm just gonna there. I'm just gonna make an appeal here and then why don't you have our closing okay. prayer. And, and the appeal is born right out of Galatians 6, 14. It's a verse we read just moments ago, but I want you to, I want you to say, I want this to be true of me. It doesn't mean that mm. you've arrived. It doesn't mean that you're perfect. It doesn't mean that you won't fail and fall. And as Paul says, be overtaken in a fault. But do you want to say with me and with Ty, I want that to be true of me. What Paul said about himself, I want to be able to say, and here it is. As for me, God forbid that I should boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus, the Messiah, through whom the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. Mm, mm. Ty, I want to be able to say that. Mm. And I know you want to be able to say that, and we want to invite you to say with Paul and with us, I don't want to boast about anything. You might be gifted, you might be talented, you might have resources, great, great. Make your boast in Jesus, the infinite, eternal, illimitable God of the universe that became a man, hung mm -hmm. on Calvary's tree. If you're going to boast about something, mm. if I'm going to boast about something, yeah. let it be that we have an awesome God. Yeah. We have an we amazing sure God. Yeah. All right, let's pray, David. Father in heaven, wow, what a whirlwind journey through the book of Galatians. Uh, we've done this in, in eight discussions. It could have taken 20 or 25 or 30 discussions. There's so much here. It's rich. Father, we thank you for calling the Apostle Paul to be the minister of the gospel to the Gentiles. Mm. Thank you for the courage that you gave him to open the door. Here we sit a couple of Gentiles mm. who now can identify as Israel. Um, there is so much to be thankful for in what you have done for us individually. And we know that those who have been with us on this journey, they can also identify in their lives Amen. things for which they are eternally grateful that you have done for them through the Messiah jesus and all that he has achieved for us as our savior father thank you put your blessing upon us as we continue our journey with you and may we never boast in anything mm. except the cross of our lord jesus christ in whose name we pray amen amen